Much of the history of Williamsburg could be written in the history of Bassett Hall. Built in the mid-1700s by a member of the colony's small group of wealthy and powerful planters, the house was convenient to the trade shops and government buildings of the growing capital city. The name Bassett Hall came later from owner Burl Bassett, a nephew of Martha Washington and a member of the Congress of the new United States. By the mid-1800s, an elaborate portico had been added to the house. During the Civil War, Union Colonel George Armstrong Custer entered through it when he came to attend a wedding of a West Point classmate, then a Confederate prisoner of war, recuperating at Bassett Hall from wounds he had received during the fierce battle to defend the town. In War and Peace, visited by the famous and the anonymous, Bassett Hall changed, fading with the town that time forgot. But in the 20th century, Bassett Hall was again witness to history. It was first an inspiration and then a home for Mr. and Mrs. John D. Rockefeller, Jr., the benefactors who opened at Williamsburg a window into America's past. Into the quiet little town of Williamsburg on a March day in 1926 drove the richest family in America. Abby Aldrich and John D. Rockefeller, Jr. and three of their sons were on their way from a visit to nearby Hampton Institute, one of the colleges for African Americans the Rockefellers had long supported. The trip to Williamsburg had been planned so Mr. Rockefeller could see the Phi Beta Kappa Memorial Hall being built at the College of William and Mary. Then they would go on to the historic sites at Yorktown and Jamestown. Waiting for the Rockefellers was the Reverend Dr. William Archer Rutherford Goodwin, rector of Bruton Parish Church, a professor and fundraiser at the college, and fellow Phi Beta Kappa. Goodwin was also a dreamer of dreams, and it was with an extraordinary dream in mind that he waited here at Bassett Hall. Goodwin's dream was to turn back the clock on this small and fading town and to give the world a chance to see again the time in history when America was an idea taking shape. He had restored Bruton Parish Church and more recently the George Wythe House, which he used as a rectory. But these were only two buildings in a whole town of 1920s facades, electric lines and filling stations. Two schools and an electric power plant now sat on land where the governor's palace had once stood. The Capitol building lay in ruins, its history recalled by a stone marker. The dream Dr. Goodwin had was a dream that would need to be shared by someone with the means to make it come true. John D. Rockefeller Jr.'s father had not finished high school, but by age 19, Rockefeller Sr. had set up his first business. By 24, he had gone into the newfangled business of refining oil and in time had organized the world's largest petroleum company, Standard Oil. Rockefeller Sr. established innovative ways of giving his fortune away. The sense of religious obligation that motivated him was inherited by his son, John Jr., who believed the only real justification for power is service. With his wife, Abby, the younger Rockefellers devoted their married life to using their wealth for the good of humanity. Rockefeller money supported the research that found cures for malaria and yellow fever. It funded successful food production programs in Mexico, India, and the Philippines. John Jr. personally arranged for the repair of the Palace of Versailles in France after World War I and underwrote the building of an archaeological museum in Jerusalem. He bought and gave the U.S. government land so that the natural beauty of the Grand Tetons in Wyoming, Acadia National Park in Maine, and Palisades Park in New York and New Jersey could be protected. His support built colleges and schools for African Americans and the white rural poor in the southern United States. And in all these endeavors, Mr. Rockefeller took a personal interest. As chairman of the National Committee, which raised money to build Phi Beta Kappa Memorial Hall in honor of the fraternity which was founded at William and Mary in 1776, Rockefeller came to Williamsburg to see how construction was coming along. In Williamsburg, we were greeted by Dr. Goodwin, who of course was a very charming and a very persuasive individual, uh, and he took us around 
of course, to the Bruton Parish Church, of which he was the rector. But I remember particularly going to the George Wythe House, which um, he told us was one of the most important of the historic buildings still standing. Goodwin did not confront the Rockefellers with his dream while he showed them around. Instead, he just shared his enthusiasm for the town and hoped his fervor might be infectious. That November, when Rockefeller returned to Williamsburg for the dedication of Phi Beta Kappa Hall, Goodwin rented a car and took him on a longer tour. This tour ended where the first one had begun, at Bassett Hall. There, as they walked together behind the house near the majestic old oak at the wood's edge, Goodwin described his dream. Rockefeller listened, then continued his walk alone with his thoughts. Later that night, as they sat at the dedication dinner, Rockefeller told Goodwin he would finance only architectural sketches visualizing a restored Williamsburg, and only on the condition that his involvement be kept secret. Just days later, Rockefeller's careful response to the dream was tested. Goodwin informed him that the Ludwell Paradise House, a key 18th century building on Duke of Gloucester Street, had suddenly come up for sale. Rockefeller surrendered his initial caution, but not his anonymity. He sent a telegram from David's father. It said, buy it. With the philanthropists okay, Goodwin hired William G. Perry, an architect from Boston, whom he met while restoring the Wythe House. Perry put his firm to work drawing sketches of the proposed restoration without knowing who was paying him. Step by step, with many visits and extensive correspondence, Rockefeller became as committed to the dream as Goodwin. Neither had any idea how long such an extensive project might take. Goodwin thought the work might take 10 years. Rockefeller talked of giving three, four, or perhaps even $5 million. But Williamsburg proved to be a grander inspiration. It was with a feeling of very real reverence, as though we were walking on hallowed ground, that my associates and I entered upon the task of restoring the Williamsburg of earlier days. What a temptation to sit in silence and let the past speak to us of those great patriots whose voices once resounded in these halls and whose far-seeing wisdom, high courage, and unselfish devotion to the common good will ever be an inspiration to noble living. For the rest of their lives, John and Abby Rockefeller watched this process for several weeks each spring and fall from the place they first knew in Williamsburg, Bassett Hall. From the beginning, Goodwin had realized the importance of Rockefeller's continued involvement in what became their shared dream. He also quickly realized the attraction modest, quiet Bassett Hall held for this man of wealth, power, and celebrity. Abby, too, seemed delighted with their new home. She told a friend, I am so happy today. John has promised me we can have Bassett Hall. And he says I can keep it if I promise not to take in tourists. Mother loved the uh, quiet of the place and the intimacy of it. It was a good deal smaller than homes that we had in either uh, New York or in, in, in uh, Seal Harbor in Maine. And I think it was a place that she enjoyed as, as much as almost any place in the last uh, couple of decades of her life. Everyone in town soon knew Mrs. Rockefeller. She helped assemble packages for lonely GIs and knitted scarves for soldiers stationed down the road. She put on a colonial ball gown for a Christmas party at the college and led the effort to build Bruton Heights School and Community Center for African Americans. A teacher at that school, Clara Bird Baker, said of her, she had the courage for the great tasks and the patience for the small ones. Mr. Rockefeller, reserved and formal, entered more and more into the life of Williamsburg, too. A teetotaler all his life, he unbent his principles enough to buy a bottle of bourbon, the admission fee to a men's sidewalk conversation society called the Pulaski Club. 
At a time burdened by racial segregation, he insisted that African Americans be admitted to the ceremony when the city presented him with his portrait. Rockefeller hired the best professionals to plan and supervise the restoration because he wanted the best and he didn't want to be bothered with details, or so he said. But he became a familiar figure walking the streets with a folding rule in his hip pocket to measure the progress of the dream. Rockefeller's commitment of $5 million grew to more than $68 million to restore 88 original buildings and rebuild many others. At that, his generosity could not complete the project. But it did create a place of such great appeal that it has continued to attract the interest of millions of visitors and supporters. Abby Aldrich Rockefeller died on April 15, 1948, shortly before the time of her annual spring pilgrimage to Bassett Hall. John D. Rockefeller, Jr. died on May 11, 1960. A memorial service for him was held under the ancient oak where he and Goodwin first shared the dream of a restored Williamsburg. <laughs>